If you're in ministry, it is so important that what you say and what you do comes from a heart of truth. Now, we all make mistakes. Yes, that's true. But we need to be honest in how we deal with people, and especially when we're speaking from the pulpit. We're going to dive deep on this coming up. Hi, I'm Troy King, and I know that ministry is a tremendous blessing, but it's also challenging and sometimes lonely. I'm here to tell you that you're not alone. Together, we'll explore the mindset and heart set of ministry so that you can nurture a worship atmosphere in your church where people can encounter God and worship Him freely. This is the Worship Atmosphere Podcast. Welcome back to Worship Atmosphere. My name is Troy, and it's so glad to be back with you. I know it's been a long time coming. The podcast here has kind of uh, uh, gone uh, dormant for a little bit. And I have to tell you, of all the projects I've worked on, this is probably one of the most challenging. It's um, it's really hard to, to put some of these things together uh, just from a, a time perspective, but I'm committed to, I, I believe this is a work of the Lord, and so I really want to uh, get get these out on a routine basis. So thank you for being here and for watching. Uh, this show is primarily on YouTube. I was going to have an MP3 stream, but uh, you know, it's just it's just a lot of work to get that going. So I think I'm going to go with just a YouTube channel. So if, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, please give this video a like. Consider subscribing to the channel. And uh, remember to hit the bell icon so you get notified of new videos because I will be putting out some new videos here in the short future, short term future. So, uh, and please spread the word. If you enjoyed this, please share it with a friend who's in ministry who could use some encouragement. That's my purpose and my goal here to encourage you. So, today we're talking about the importance of the truth, right? The importance of the truth. Now, you can look through scripture and you can find all sorts of things about truth and how the truth will set you free and this, that, and the other. And, and that's all great, all well and good. But I'm looking at it specifically from a ministerial point of view here. Uh, because people are coming to church. They're coming to your church. They're identifying with being part of your congregation. And they are looking for something. They're not showing up because they're bored. I'm guessing not. Maybe some are. But I'm, I'm guessing most people are there. They, they, they're making an intentional effort to, to look nice or dress up a little bit maybe. And, and drive or walk or however they're getting there. But they're coming to the church. They're, and um, you know, they're looking for hope. They're looking for answers. Especially now with... Uh, with COVID and all the stuff going on, they are looking for something. And people are trusting you as the, the pastor, as a minister, as a lay leader in your church. They're looking to you to speak truth into their lives. They're looking for God. They know God is honest and truthful and faithful. It's in his word. I mean, even, even bumper stickers agree God is faithful. God is awesome. God is wonderful. People believe it, for the most part. Um, and they're coming to you, and you're supposed to be a minister of God, and exhibiting behaviors that uh, you know that fit the role. Everything that's said and done on and off the platform must be done with honesty. It's about integrity. It's about not being partial to any one person or people group, right? Because God is impartial. If we're representing God, how can we show partiality? I know as humans, it's easy to do that. It's, it's easy to go hang out with the people who are most like you. It's a challenge to hang out with people who are very different from you. But whatever you're saying and doing, it must be equal and it must be truthful. This all stemmed from uh, 1 Timothy 4.16. I was reading uh, this pastoral epistle from Paul to Timothy one day and it struck me. 
Keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the, and the salvation of those who hear you. Now, this, this is so important that we understand this, okay? Because there is a lot of Bible, right? The Bible is a big book, big book. And it's easy to get things confused. It's easy to take things out of context. That is one of the biggest things. And it's, it's not that people are trying to be evil, okay? It's people who are well-intentioned. For example, uh, and I say this all the time over on uh, Bible Study with Troy, which is a Bible study channel I have on YouTube, and go check it out. It's great. <laughs> and uh, people will say all the time about the 120 people who were in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, right? Okay, so scripturally, we know that there were 120 people gathered together at some point, okay, in the book of Acts. But the gathering in the upper room was at a, I think it was like the next day. It was, it was some time later. So there may have been 120, but we don't know for sure. There may have been more, there may have been less. We don't know how many people exactly. If you go read Acts, it's, it's very clear. But there are faith streams and traditions that have just, someone had the idea of, oh, it's 120 in the upper room, so let's go preach on it. And I have heard all my life, message after message about the 120 in the upper room until I, until I met my pastor who said, were there really 120 people in the upper room? Go read Acts. Go look at it. What does it say? And it does not clearly say there were 120 in the upper room. Just that at one point, 120 had gathered. And then sometime later, a bunch of people were gathered in the upper room. It doesn't say how many were specifically in the upper room. Now, is that a salvation issue? No, I don't believe it is. However, it's indicative of a root problem. Okay, We take things out of, out of context. We, we make assumptions about Scripture. We take a commentary and we elevate it to the level of Scripture. We can't do that. We can't take a commentary and apply to it the same authoritative <laughs> meaning that's given to Scripture. Because it's a guy's thought or a group of people's thought about Scripture. It's not the same thing. Um, we have to understand that there are well-meaning preachers who are very famous, who will preach a, preach a great message on something, but the context of the verse they're using is totally inappropriate. And we have to be really careful about that because it turns into a slippery slope, right? So now, well, I'm taking this verse, you know, this verse says what I want it to say. It makes a good preaching point, but the context for it isn't appropriate, but I'm going to use it anyways. I find that to be disingenuous, don't you? If I'm taking the time to come and listen to your message you had better give me truth. You had better have done your research and make sure that the scripture you're quoting applies contextually, uh, or uh, that the context applies correctly. That's what I'm trying to say. Otherwise, you are deceiving me. Otherwise, you are making it up as you go along. And that's not right. And that's not right. We don't want to do that. We don't want to give people bad information because it comes around, right? And I know from personal experience, I uh, was raised in a, a church that had very conservative values, and so they preached things that were a good idea, but not necessarily biblical, okay? Uh, with the, it, was, it was good-meaning people with the intention of of trying to safeguard my soul, and I appreciate that for what it is. However, if that particular mandate is not in Scripture, you need to tell me that. 
you know, don't make, and I'm not saying, that, I'm not saying that anyone was trying to deceive me or doing anything intentional. I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that if you're creating a system of safeguards for people for the salvation of their souls, then tell them these are the rules of our, of our church, of our congregation. This is what scripture says. And based upon this scripture, we are going to have these, these guidelines or these rules that, that we should live by that our pastor has said, this is the way we're going to go forward. That's fine. That is perfectly fine. But you need to be clear that any particular mandate is not, if it's not in the, if it's not in the book, don't say it is. Or don't, you know, don't finagle your way out of it. But just be clear. Say, this is what the Bible says. This is the scriptural basis for our decision for how we want to live as a group of believers. These are the rules we're going to live by for the sake of our souls and our salvation so we don't fall into, into temptation. Okay? So, otherwise, like I later on found out in life that, hey, this particular thing, and I don't even remember what it was, but it was this particular thing, while a good idea, wasn't necessarily founded in Scripture. Because I, I hadn't... I, I was like a teenager. I hadn't fully, you know, I, I didn't know how to fully read the Bible and understand the context and do research. And, and, um, and it did damage. It did damage to my perception of the organization and, and, and certain people. And it just, it, it, it took, the Lord had to come by later and heal me of, of the hurt that was in my heart. Um, and he did a fabulous job, by the way. <laughs> So what I'm saying is you have to be clear and honest with your people. If, if you're, you have to be truthful. It is so important because if you're not, if, if the deceit or the lie or just the bad information, let's, you know, even, even if you're, again, well-meaning, a well-meaning person, good intentions, but if your misstep gets found out, it looks really bad on you. And it's going to hurt the person. It's going to hurt the congregation. It's going to hurt the body of Christ. And we don't want that. We don't want that. So we just want to be transparent and honest because it is so important. Ezekiel 33 is uh, where God is laying out the, the rules for being a watchman. Right? If the watchman sees the sword coming, sees the danger coming. He has a responsibility to tell the people to sound the alarm. If he does, and the people still don't listen, they're going to die because it's you know the sword is coming, and they're going to die for their sin. But if they listen and they respond, then they'll be saved. And that's the part, that's the whole purpose of the watchman, right? Judgment is coming. The sword is coming. You better, you better do something about it. Okay. Oh, now we're saved, and the watchman's done their job. Um, but if the watchman, however, sees judgment coming, sees the sword coming, and says nothing, the people are still going to die for their sin, because they're sinning against God. But now the watchman is going to be held accountable, because he didn't tell them the truth. He didn't tell them that danger was coming. He, you know, as a minister, if you receive a word from the Lord for your people... You had better give them the word from the Lord, and if it, and, it's, and then it's on them. Okay, as long as you do your part and you communicate the word the Lord has given you for your people, then it's up to them. If they respond, glory, hallelujah. If they don't, that's a crying shame. But if you receive a word from the Lord and you don't tell the people, you don't sound the alarm, you don't let them know, then they are still going to die. And you will be responsible for their deaths. And that's, again, not a situation that you want to be in. <laughs> it's just not good. So we have a responsibility as ministers. If the, if the Lord God Almighty has given you a message, if he's given you a word, you present that word to your people. It doesn't matter how hard it is. It doesn't matter how tough it is. It doesn't matter if they're going to give you a bunch of pushback and half the church is going to leave. If God has given you a word, you need to give it. That's just how it is. Malachi chapter 2 shows us a corrupt priesthood. 
And it's, it's bad enough that people are offering improper sacrifices. They're not bringing their best. They're not bringing, you know, the, the, the uh, unblemished uh, sacrifices. They're, they're crippled. They're lame. They're diseased. They're, they're gross. And God's like, you, you wouldn't give a gift like this to your governor. Why do you think you can give it to me? <laughs> you know, that's ridiculous. Try again. Um, so that's bad enough. But, but in addition to that, the priests, the priests are showing partiality in their instruction and it's not working so good for them. Malachi chapter 2, verse 7, For the lips of a priest should keep knowledge and people should seek the law from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Wow. He's the messenger of the Lord of hosts. As, uh, as, as I'm beginning my, my preaching career, I really do, I mean, I, I've had a couple messages the Lord gave me inspiration for. And I, and I started off with it, but then I didn't really have anything additional until a year later when like oh oh this tidbit would go perfect for this message and then i can finish it and round it out now why did it take a year for it all to transpire i don't know but i i always wait for inspiration and revelation from god to confirm a message i believe he gives me an initial uh inkling of what it is initial concept and then as I continue to read or listen to, to, to other messages, or sermons, um, as I study, I gain more information, which then allows me to refine and, and add to the, the, the initial foundation of that message so that when it's done and I feel like, okay, yes, this is a full and complete message, then I give it to my pastor and say, here, look it over. Let me know. What's your feedback? I want to make sure there's no errors or mistakes. I want to make sure that the scriptures I've chosen are contextually appropriate and I'm not just making stuff up. You know? Um, so, I want to make sure that the message I receive from the Lord, that I back it up with scripture and that it makes sense, that it's appropriate. Otherwise, if I'm just picking scriptures out of the air because they sound good and because they, they back up what I'm trying to say, I got a problem with that. I got a real problem with that. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it you do the best you can, right? And that's why if you have a mentor or someone who can check your work, especially if you're starting out in ministry, I mean, if you've been doing it for 20 years, then, you know, you should still have a mentor, right? But uh, maybe they're not looking through your Sunday morning messages, but you need to have accountability to somebody and have someone like who can kind of like, hey, you know, let's fact check what you're talking about here and make sure. Um, because we want to we want to be truthful. Now, what if you make a mistake? Right? And it happens to everybody. You're in the flow. You're you're uh, feeling the anointing of the spirit and they're responding, and you've stepped away from your notes or your script, and you're you're just going at it. And suddenly, you're talking about how when the people were shouting down the walls of Jericho, Jericho, uh, they were putting their faith in the name of Jesus. <laughs> um, they didn't have the name Jesus at Jericho. That was the Old Testament. Jesus wasn't revealed until the New Testament. So... Uh, it's easy to make that mistake, and I've come real close to making that that particular mistake. Um, but you have to be careful with those things. And if, if in that moment you realize it, go ahead and correct yourself. Go ahead and say, you know, oh, uh, Jehovah, excuse me. Or you know, in Scripture, they uh, I don't think they referenced any particular names when they were shouting. They were just they were just shouting and and making the the noise. Or times when, uh, you know, when, when God was visiting them in the temple in the wilderness. Well, they, wait, they, they didn't have a temple in the wilderness. When they were wandering around for 40 years, they had a tabernacle. 
they had a tabern. The temple didn't come until they were in the land of Canaan, and then King Solomon finally uh, built the thing. So you have to make sure that your your words are right. And if you slip up, it's okay. We're human. We make mistakes, but just fess up to it. Make the correction as soon as you can. You just have to make sure that you come clean. And if you admit it is an honest mistake, people will forgive you. I mean, things like that, probably not salvation issues. You're not going to uh, send them off the rails to hell because you, you use the name Jesus at Jericho. I mean, it, things like that are, are not that big a deal. But when it comes to salvation issues, you need to make sure your facts are straight. You need to make sure you're saying the right thing. You need to make sure, for example, that you follow the, the direction of the apostles when they were baptizing people in the name of Jesus in the book of Acts. You read in the book of Acts, chapter 2, 8, 10, and 19, they use the name of Jesus. Um, you shouldn't be baptizing people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, like Jesus instructed in, in Matthew 28, 19. And this is a freebie. This is a freebie for you today. Jesus was giving a command in Matthew 28, 19, but the apostles were fulfilling the command by using the name of Jesus, because the name of the Father is Jesus, the name of the Son, obviously Jesus, and the name of the Holy Ghost is Jesus. And we see that throughout Scripture. We'll do another Bible study on that sometime if you're confused. Um, so if you're baptizing somebody, you had better be doing the name of Jesus and not Father, Son, Holy Ghost, because that's a misappropriation of the context of Scripture. So it is so important. And that, that is a salvation issue. So you better have your feet grounded on that one, friend. Um, because the watchman isn't on, on par. The, the, the watchman isn't doing their job. They're not really reading Scripture. Um, they're being affected by tradition. And in fact, just to back that up, the Father, Son, Holy Ghost thing didn't come until the Nicene Convention a couple hundred years later, after after uh, the disciples were all long dead and gone. So uh, to say that they didn't have the full truth is rubbish. It's absolute rubbish. Uh, it was not a greater revelation. It was not God-inspired. It was someone taking Jesus' words out of context. So, again, that's why it's so important that we know what the Bible says. We can't just go by the faith tradition. We can't just go by what some, some church father said a couple hundred years after the fact and said, we now have a greater revelation. No, you don't. No, you don't. Not really, because your greater revelation is not backed up by Scripture. That's the thing. If you have a revelation from God, you make sure it is backed up in Scripture. If it's not, then it's null and void. All revelation from God must be backed up by His Word. Otherwise, you're talking lies. You're making it up as you go along. And you can't do that because your people are counting on you. They're trusting in you. They're believing in you. That what you are saying is honest. It's truthful. It's okay to make a mistake, but you got to come clean and, and tell them how it actually is. You just have to. So, what do we do? What do we do from this point? Make sure you have... Bible study tools available to you, whatever that looks like. Maybe it's a, a, a library on the bookshelf. Maybe it's the Logos Bible software. Maybe it's, uh, you know, go to your mentor. Hey, is this, is this uh, you know, scripture being used in the proper context? What, what is the context behind this particular book of the Bible, or this passage? What's going on here? Why is Paul writing this way to these people? You know, get to understand what's going on behind but behind the scenes, behind their authorship, because there is context there. Um, even though it's 2,000 years and you know, a million cultures away, it seems, there's context that can be understood. Uh, remember, the scripture was, was not written to us, but it was written for us, so therefore it does have application. But we need to know the original intention of the author so that we can present a truthful application to our saints, to our sheep, who really belong to Jesus, right? So, uh, find some resource tools. Find a mentor. 
do something to make sure that you are you're doing the right thing and spend time in prayer if, if maybe there's something maybe god's talking to you like oh you know what uh you, you've been you've been preaching outside the lines you need to get back to basics you need to get back to the word um and just listen to what he's saying listen to his voice so i pray this has been a blessing i pray this has inspired and encouraged you and helped you if you've enjoyed this please give me a thumbs up down below consider subscribing to the channel and um hit that bell <laughs> icon to get notified of new videos because new videos are coming um i do want this to be a blessing to uh to ministers all uh, you know new ministers seasoned ministers alike uh, i pray this is a blessing for you so thank you so much for watching i appreciate you god bless we'll see you next time